Today, um, be talking about Pano Fire Recovery. My name is Taryn Mangelsdorf, as we stated. I'm based in Goula, so those who come from North South Australia, that's about an hour north of here. My role in sustainable agriculture is largely about engagement and education with farmers, landholders, and agricultural bureaus. So today, we're talking about what we did in fire recovery, how we did it, why we did what we did. Now, unfortunately, in our area, this is the fourth fire in three years that we had. So we were quite well versed in fire recovery after Eden Valley and Sampson Flat. Um, Eden Valley was burnt twice. Unfortunately, this was a more severe fire for a number of reasons, which we'll go through. Um, so today I'll be doing a lot of facilitation, little facilitation things. So the first thing that you might notice is there's pipe cleaners and some sticky notes and some pieces of paper on your table. So this means that the kinesthetic learners and the different types of learners um, can fiddle and do whatever you need to do, so make flowers or bicycles or just twirl them around in your hands. So you, if you need to fidget, you're most welcome to. So when we're organising events, we're catering for the different learning styles. So the Pinery Fire started on 25th of November um, in Pinery. We'd never really heard of Pinery before, it's more of a locality. Um, however, in CFS, um, the fire is called after where it started. It started as a stationary farm vehicle before it rapidly spreading initially southeast and then directly south. It burnt 82,500 hectares in five hours, and this was the fire front. It caused two deaths, um, destroyed at least 90 odd houses, with at least that many houses again that were and are still unlivable. About 200 structures, about 400 vehicles, and much, much more in farm machinery. Um, major damage occurred to a lot of the towns in the area, including Owen, Hamley Bridge, Wasley's, Freeling, Tiley, and Greenock. So a lot of localities in the mid north. Who's from interstate here? There we go. South Australians. There's a few. All right. So the majority of the landscape of crop was cropping in various stages of harvest, mixed with sheep grazing, an intensive agriculture with chickens and pigs. Just over the. This is the map of the area and. Pinery is that little corner there. Um, what happened was the fire initially burnt down and then as the wind changed it fingered across and it was a different type of burn. Um, and now I work for Adelaide Mount Lofty Ranges which is the southern half of the fire and the northern half is northern in York. Now this is the image that the farmers that we're working with were faced with. They were either on farm fire units, CFS trucks, um, either people got out of there they didn't have much warning or they had very little warning compared to what they had. They thought they had about half an hour, some of them had about 30 seconds or two minutes. There's stories of people putting stuff in their car, forgot the car keys, went back inside to get the car keys, came out and the car was alive. So there are some really traumatic people that we're dealing with. So just as a start to get your head in the game, and this, isn't, this is probably the lowest point of today, just have a think about what would you feel like as a community member going through something like this. So you can write it down, you can think about it. Um, and our great uh, volunteer Bert here is going to write some things down. So what are some feelings that are going through your head if you confront, were confronted with this? Terrified. <laughs> Terrified, so... Terrified. So I'm going to just repeat it so the mic picks it up. What are some other feelings? Fear. Fear? Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Confusion. Oh, confusion. And confusion was a big part because people just didn't know where to go. Now, out of all of this, I know one farmer that got out. Every other person that I'm working with either didn't know where their family was or couldn't get back in to save their house or um, were stuck in it. So one farmer I know got out and he actually reversed out because he, was gonna, he thought he could get out of the way of the fire, but the fire front was so big and he didn't have enough visibility that he couldn't turn around. So he reversed for several k's up a road until he knew that he was at a crossroads. He laughs about it, but... So, what are the issues? This was uh, still as the fire was going. So you can see over here, the fire still going, sand drift is happening over here. That happened immediately and even hampered the firefighting efforts. Um, and everything that we're doing, and we've said, uh, we're talking about engagement here, everything that you've just said, we had to take that in consideration in everything that we did. So it wasn't just a normal job task for us. 
All right. So all these farmers had spent 30 odd years doing some really good things with no-till farming, soil retention, uh, stabilisation, stubble retention, soil moisture. There had been some really great land managers in the last 30 odd years with some best farming practices. The fire took out all of the ground cover and because of the timing of the fire, it essentially meant that it was about four to five months before any substantial ground cover came back. Now this was about two, three, four weeks after the fire and this is what life was like for about four months after the fire. The houses that were still livable, they literally boarded up the windows and the doors so they could actually live in them because the sand drift was so bad. So here are some of the other issues that the people faced. The soil health, non-winning sands and fertility. I do appreciate there's some agronomic terms here for the people who do work in agriculture. I know there's a mix of people in the room. Lack of soil cover and stubble, therefore lack of moisture. Um, livestock and suitability, suitability of paddocks and adjustment by security. Um, Revegetation, regeneration of trees because people just wanted to see green again. The removal of Aleppo pines were quite costly because they're quite large and tall. Um, Property planning, this pro, uh, gave people some opportunities, but it also created some of the biggest barriers. Um, there's weed issues, there's pest animal control issues with rabbits, foxes and mice, and also abundant native species issues with a lot of kangaroos in the area, but not a lot to eat. So we had a lot of grazing pressure, um, total grazing pressure that we were controlling and managing. And timing. So in the past we've talked about Samson Flat Fire. They're, because they're mostly landholders, there wasn't a lot of direction about timing of recovery. Whereas these guys were thinking about the next harvest. What about the next harvest? I have to get ready for the timing of the season. So, where am I up to? I've skipped my notes. <laughs> Alright, so we said that these are the issues. I'd like to ask you how you think that we came up with those list of issues there that I just had. What do you think we did? We talked to them, yep. What else do you think we did, Lou? Observations. Observations, yep. You would have had recovery mechanisms, agencies working in the space that would know the types of issues as uh, well. Absolutely, yep. Not all of them, some of them. Yep, and sharing of information, yep. And technical advice, working groups. Yep, technical working groups. Absolutely, learnings from previous fires. So what we did, um, we essentially just sat at the back of the room for a lot of the community meetings and learned and gathered information. We had farmer technical reference groups that we did um, to ask the people specifically and then in those technical groups they said, oh we need help with rabbit control. So we said, awesome, we can help you through all of these methods in terms of providing your rabbit ripper. Fact sheets, advice, we can get people with Pingone and 1080 out here to help you do it. We can get contractors, what do you need? They just said a fact sheet. So it was really pointing to ask how people wanted help and not just what the topics were. And it's something as simple as rabbit control. And we did that with everything that we did. So the next part is about understanding the audience. So who works with farmers or landholders here? Awesome. Who's not really got much to do with farmers? Awesome mix of Okay, so can you tell me some traits about a farmer? I know the back table's in there. Some people that you work with. Often introvert. Introverts, yes. Introvert. Yeah, yep. So typically under my briefs, who knows about my briefs? A few, yep. So typically a farmer is an introvert, however some of them are now changing to be extroverts. So you're catering for both types and making sure that they both feel um, protected and happy and everything else. Um, almost. <laughs> um, what, about, what, what about a farmer? What else? They don't often ask for help. They don't often ask for help, especially these people. They're quite independent. That is very true. Um, what else? The communities are often quite close-knit, so even if it's a community of three or four farmers, they'll probably at least just stick together rather than ask for the outside help. That's exactly right, and that goes with the independence, that they'll ask for each other and they'll see what people are doing across the fence, um, rather than taking, for example, us walking in and us doing something quite separately. Any last ones that haven't been said yet? Very practical. 
and practical. And Andrew? They're also armed. Yeah. <laughs> and the women, yes. the women um, engage differently often to the men. So farm women will engage differently. And that's a very good point that a lot of people came and identified them as farming women. Um, that's very good. They, they have resistance to seeing folk? Yes. In the most polite way, yes. <laughs> Probably another thing, Tara and Sal generally look to help others before helping themselves as well. So they might be thinking more about their own issues, but they'll go out and help their neighbour as a first step rather than helping themselves. And that was one of the beautiful stories that came out of it, exactly, Louis, is that um, there were people who rocked up to houses with farm machinery um, and just said, what do you need? Um, which was very quite nice, and people shared tractors, because literally everyone lost everything. They didn't have anything to save their soil. So how do you think we communicate with these people, which is what Bert's going to be writing up? What do you think is really important when we're communicating with those types of people? Sorry, one size don't fit. One size doesn't fit. Going to them. Going to them, absolutely. Go through the lead, like community leaders, all those sparkle people that are the blue people in that community. Yep, absolutely. And going through the community leaders. Just trying to make sure you captured everyone. Everyone's included. Yep. So in all of that, I think Bert's doing a wonderful job by the way, he's a volunteer and he's doing his PhD in urban design development, if that's right. Yeah. Good, awesome. Um, so underneath that last one, Bert, is your last piece of paper that you're going to be filling in. So let's just review the challenges. What were some of the challenges that these people faced? Lack of communication. Lack of communication, yep. It doesn't have Lack to... And systems. And so systems, yep. Yeah. No computers, no phones, everything else. No water, no electricity. Their community is being dispersed. Absolutely. Yep, so some people were as far as 200 k's away because they didn't have a house. Um, lack of services and lack of community. Loss of cash flow from crops and livestock. Massive issue. And we literally had people in tears in our office going, what am I going to do? I've lost everything. Loss of uh, physical resources. Loss of, yep. Um, lock of, uh, cash flow and physical resources. Okay, okay. so this is our next trauma. I just say trauma. trauma. Really yep, a... that sums it up quite nicely. So these tables here, can you just have a think about for the next two or three minutes? If you were community members and you needed to learn about a, an event, what would you need to know? What would get you there? These guys, can you please have a think about if you're organising an event, what would you need to consider? So talking to tables, you've got about two to three minutes. So if you're community members, what do you need to what do you need to know about to go to an event? If you're organising something, what do you need to consider? Alright, let's wrap those conversations up. There's some really cool things. So this this table, what what's what are some things that you came up with? In terms of, so this this side of the table was doing who? Probably this community. Community, and these guys were doing what? What? Uh, what we yeah, what we consider? Perfect. All right, you guys, what did you come up with? Um, time, location, transport. Can you hear her? Any other additions there? Beautiful. What about this table? Same? Wow. Well done. All right. These signs. What did you guys come up with as if you're organising an event? Same sort of things. It's the location, timing, so what's happening in the community. I mean, I know that there are still crops being taken off as well as people assisting, so what's the best time to put these on? The content and how we present it, so it's about practical information. Um, familiar faces, so maintaining consistency of the people that you're going to put there, um, also knowing that these are long term things, so it's not just going to be one off event, it's going to be an ongoing thing. Absolutely, well done, you basically wrote my score sheet there. Alright, what about these guys, what did you come up with? Pretty much the same, 
um, that the venue needs to be familiar as long as it's survived, um, and that it's accessible, um, that it's a social opportunity, as well as all that, the, the right agencies being there with the right information, it's also a social opportunity. So seeing from familiar faces that people are still alive and people are still around to help. Um, and I, I always have this food, is always important. Um, but also the opportunity for them to get something out of it, that they're not just going to waste their time and that they'll, they'll take something away. Absolutely, and I think you've mentioned something else about messaging I overheard, making sure it was short, sharp, shiny messaging, that it was relevant for that day. We could have been talking to them in the next day. What was relevant then? They were fantastic ones. Well done. You guys are really considered and thinking very much in the headspace of what these guys need. So you basically have done your engagement very well. Alright, so a lot of what you were saying then is a lot about resilience, the food. So I know that I did get a coffee van there on one time because I did a breakfast meeting. So that's meeting some of the things that you just said, the timing of the day, um, the food, the drink, what did they need? And we did it in the footy club rooms. Everything we did was in the footy club rooms because people know exactly what they are. So the fire recovery project objective. So let's talk about a little bit internally what we did and our, our approach. So we carried this aim over from Samson Flat Fire Recovery and that was essentially to build resilient communities in what we did. As a team we developed these dot points and felt that they were quite applicable to our work and drove it and made it us motivated and focused. This slide was how we can help um, and it was what we were the relevant authority for. for so, so in South Australia we've got PERSA, Primary Industries, Natural Resources and Natural Resources sits under the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources. So we were very clear on what we were the, the relevant authority for and what we could help. And so we had the internal structures with the other organisations as to what we did and what other people did. So these two slides, particularly this slide, we put up at almost everything that we presented at. What do you think are the benefits of me doing that? What do you think the people felt in seeing this so many times? Stability. Stability. Consistency. Likely to remember. Consistency, likely to remember it. It's really clear and you're not going to, um, they're not going to have false expectations of what, how much you can do. Absolutely, and that was the biggest thing that we wanted to be really clear what we could deliver and what wasn't in our area. And we had to manage that and make sure it was realistic for the people. Um, and Traumatised people might not take it in, they might think they take it in. If you're busy, your head is scattered, how do you think you feel then, let alone everything else. These people are just trying to do, like the Maslow's hierarchy, they're trying to go through it all. This is at the end of their bucket. Yes? So I was just going to say, how, when such a traumatised community, how uh, is government working together? So who's providing the family assistance and the emotional counselling? And if you just say, sorry, we only do soil and livestock. Like, yep can't help you, how is that helping build resilience in a community when you are there and like were you there with like a road show of other agencies? Uh, particularly at the start we were at the road show, so and that essentially was not what we called it but it was. Um, in the recovery centre there's Red Cross helping invite people in at the door and so they got to know Red Cross really well. United Care Ministries is doing door knocking. Um, DCSI, Department of Housing and Centrelink are the first point of call and they literally go around the room in terms of when they first register. So when I'm ever holding an event, I've always got staff from the recovery centre there. I always had people from Red Cross there as counsellors. And I even had mental health practitioners speaking as part of my farming events. So at every time we're taking care of people's mental health and making sure that our staff that were working with them, if there was any question or doubt in people's mind of people's wellbeing, we would just refer them onto the recovery centre, no questions asked. And people knew that that was our process. So which was the agency that, that coordinated the recovery overall? Um, it was under Zoe Bettison, so I think that's the Department of Community Social Inclusion, DCSI. So they, they oversee everything, or do they oversee just the community wellbeing recovery stuff? They so do oversee yeah. the insurance and the um, psychosocial wellbeing and the community events and who, who's the... They essentially do the see? overarching, okay. but then underneath that, we're, we've got our relevant authority for what we're responsible for. 
So we still report to them. We we still have fortnightly, or well now we're changed to monthly because we're in fire recovery with the same people as well. Um, where we had now up to monthly meetings as the community group leaders, uh, the community leaders meeting, and then the local recovery uh, meeting in the afternoon. So it's very structured. Um, Carly May will let it for uh, the Samson Flat Fire Recovery, and we just transferred that template across to Samson uh, to Pinery, and making sure that every pe every person that needs to be there, every organisation that was part of it, in terms of the council, um, every level of department where needed, um, community leaders, industry groups were present at that table, so everyone knew what they needed to do, and very clear as to everyone's role. So we weren't all in the same space, um, and any time I'm running an event, which we'll get to. Um, I made sure it was clear on the table and I made sure that the person in charge, which was Kirsty Dudley underneath Kayleen Hull, knew all of that and we all reported to Alex Zimmerman. So it was very clear what the structure was, even though we were reporting to a different area, which is, yeah. So yeah. does that set in your legislation, that structure, or do you form that structure for each, like you said, you pick up the template and use it for another bar. Yep. So does, is your recovery structure um, set out in your state legislation, or do you set it up per event? So we set it up per event. Um, we did some slight changes that were applicable, um, but they are writing a template for future disasters, which we've just applied to Virginia floods. You had a question? I was just going to say, we have an overarching state emergency management plan. Um, so there's a state emergency management committee which directed Dixie, DCSI, and um, so then there was sort of your, your management level of meetings there. Um, then you had your local recovery team, um, and then your individual organisations, which gave you a clear reporting line. All right, I'm just going to slip through the next couple of slides really quickly. So we've got time to finish up. We've got about 12 minutes. Um, so we identified fire recovery in three different stages. This is stage one, which is about the first month where we just gather information and listen. Uh, stage two is where we start to implement some things. So what I did in Pinery was about 17 events for about 1,000 people attended overall, plus another 30 odd events that I just attended. So I organised about 17, I attended, well, I don't know, it was several nights a week for about six or eight months. Um, but that's what we did, we're just part of the community listening. And stage three, which we're definitely in now, is getting programs back into normal delivery, um, which is what the farmers are asking for. They're about to do a harvest to complete the cycle, which they didn't get to do last time. And uh, we've got some more information about those stages if you want to talk to me after. So something that you highlighted before, and this is one of the key messages I'd like you to take away, was um, all agricultural engagement and extension was through the current relationships with the established groups. So we already knew these people, we already supported the groups and they were really important to us and to the point where um, it was a Twitter conversation two days after the fire, we sent it to a phone call which, on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock which we funded an event a day after, which I'll get to in a minute. So we identified all the issues, we identified the groups that were already established in the area um, which are all listed there and we went through them to do everything. I probably ran about two workshops that weren't through an actual group. So everything we did was through them and what they felt were the issues of the day. And down the bottom it does say in collaboration with PERSA, GRDC, Agronomist, Livestock Consultants, Recovery Centre, everyone else. So there are two strategies here which I probably don't have time to now go into detail. Um, so post-fire extension strategies, this is one of them. So I encourage you to go to Jeanette Long's Workshops with WOW website. Um, she fleshes these out a little bit more. Um, so Pinery is a little bit in that show me and tell me and I'll go away and do it, which we've highlighted. We worked out in Samson Flat that they were lower. They wanted us to hold their hand a little bit further in the strategies. So a series of attitudinal change. Who's heard of this one before? Uh, Louise, yep, you've had. Um, so when we're doing a workshop, we don't need people to walk away and all of a sudden implement something. So we were very clear that what did we need people to learn in that workshop was a very clear messaging. So we took people from ignorance to awareness, then to intent, gave them enough information to make a change. So they might not be making a change for another two years, 
but they've got the steps there and then they have to perform and then maintain that change. Once again, I think um, Jeanette's got a bit more information about this on their website, otherwise come and see me afterwards. Um, this is how we largely structured our engagement. This was five days after the fire. Um, 250 farmers rocked up, some of them in the only clothes that they still owned, about tilling um, a property. Literally, they were pulling up farm machinery from creek, creek lines because they didn't have tilling machinery. And probably most of the people in this room come from a no-tilling generation. So we didn't know how to use these pieces of machinery. And then um, this is Derek Tiller, a Nuffwood scholar, and this was his paddock. Um, and then one of these guys came up and spoke on the mic here. Um, it was 80 or trying to tell people how to use tilling machinery. And that was a real community atmosphere that they had in people wanting to learn and share. Um, same day, different colour soil different remediation, so just highlighting different pe different things um, people had to do. Um, once again, if you'd like to learn exactly a little bit more about this, there is a YouTube video. So if you go to AML Natural Resources, um, you'll see me talking a little bit more about soil stabilisation. So I did a bit about livestock management. Revegetation. So I've got 10 minutes, five minutes on each of these. So revegetation, we gave away 20,000 trees to regreen the fire scar. Um, and these were just to put in shelter belts, but these um, were for agronomic benefits to change the wind because the wind was absolutely horrendous. Um, and it was native plants for their garden, and then a lot of Adelaide Plains um, garden groups got together and propagated a lot of plants and flowers for people to do and uh, to plant and take away. So it was a beautiful day that these people walked away with some plants to put in their garden. Then Anne Libby Station, Sophie Thompson. Who's heard of Anne Libby before? One. Oh, yes. <coughs> it's beautiful. Um, it's a very stately farm house, manor, and a beautiful, beautiful garden. So look it up on, on the web. Um, and then Sophie Thompson is a presenter with Gardening SA on ABC TV. We had 170 people come. Now, what, the reason why we chose Anne Libby was... Um, it meant that people could see what a farm garden looked like with a beautiful house which a lot of people could identify with. Sophie Thompson spoke in the afternoon about um, the mental health benefits of gardening and we gave away punnets of flowers, we gave away trowels, we gave away nights roses, everything donated, a huge community effort um, and it was quite poignant because it was the first time that people had either laughed, the first time that people had either cried, the, people, the first time that a lot of people had came to an event. So emotionally, it was a massive day for these people to come out, feel loved, feel appreciated, feel valued. And I got about 30 or 40 emails before I even got back into the office that day. And overarching was, it was exactly what we needed. Because we did everything else, we asked them, we listened. How long after the fire was that? We did that in March or April. So we did it after, it was it, oh, April, May. So we did it in May because it was a late sewing. So this was the other part that it was the first, uh, there was about half a dozen women my age there came up to me and said, this is the first time I've ever asked my husband to get off the tractor sewing because I'm staying here, they're picking up the kids from school. So it was a really empowering event for a lot of the women because a lot of the men had gone to a lot of the events. Um, so yeah, early May I think it was. Getting ready for winter. So this is a really just a self-help thing. So you can't um, pour from an empty cup. What we did was a lot of personal and professional development. I've mentioned Jeanette Long and Sharon Honor. We did a lot of training with them. We did the IAP2 engagement. We did disaster management after Victorian fires. We did psychological first aid from Red Cross. Plus we did a few more master classes with um, APEN and Jeanette after that. So we did not go into this blind or whatever else thinking that we knew what to do. We, just, we knew that we needed help inside and how to set us up. So we got upskilled. So in closing, yes, you can throw them out for me. All right, I finished with chocolates because that's what I do. <laughs> throw them at my feet. And we're literally going to throw them away. Okay, so this is what I often do in closing of some workshops and seminars. So what are some of the things that we we spoke about today? Oh no no no, I have to answer a question oh. first. <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the things that we talk, spoke about today? Resilience. Resilience, she gets a chocolate. Uh, handy might be better. <laughs> um, or closer. Well, 
what, what else? What, did we, what else did we talk about today? Rebuilding communities. Rebuilding communities, absolutely. Different. I've got four different questions, but you at least get a chocolate. Different perspectives, so seeing things from community and then the organisers. Absolutely, and that's what, something that we had to do, was seeing it from a different angle. So what was the most critical part about what we did? Talking to the community, finding out what they needed. Talking, listening. He gets two chocolates. He said listening. Planning. Planning. Identifying opportunities. Identifying opportunities, absolutely. <laughs> what was the most inspiring? People's resilience, absolutely. Oh, I've got two bags of chocolates. That's okay, so your list <laughs> So, how has today been beneficial to you personally? I know it's I was hard. Say, as someone who was involved in a separate part of it, there's some learnings for us. We didn't engage with Red Cross about our staff until we actually had someone melt down. So we had. We missed an opportunity, we just threw ourselves into it and probably identified the wrong people. Wow. So, yeah, we didn't do that until probably six, eight weeks in. For me, it's been really interesting because the context that I work in is usually when there's a huge amount of outrage over some government decision that has upset people, and the emotional stakes in this are really high, but they're totally different. You've got a lot less outrage and a lot more grieving and um, but still very challenging environment to work within. I think it depends on the event though. Like, I'm from Christchurch and the outrage is huge and it's still going after six years. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you seem to be working in a very particular part of the recovery. It would be interesting to talk to Red Cross or, did you say the Department of Human Services? Or, and see Everyone. if they're yeah. getting Largely. different things about outrage, because outrage is a, is a part of that grieving Yes. in disasters, so you have the, the elation, the everyone working together, then you have an extreme dive, yep. um, which is when you get, um, not the depression, but when people just lose hope, basically. It's a and lot when that, yeah. Out, outrage, and um, it's, it's very event dependent, but it's definitely there. It's a lot when that adrenaline runs out and when the people aren't there. So we're making sure that people know that we're there, which is what that slide was up there before, that we haven't had that level of outrage. And even on statewide radio and farmers have been quizzed about our NRM levy, they've literally said, we cannot ask any more of these guys. Oh, that's awesome. So seriously, we cannot have a better response. So the last question, and probably targeting people who don't have a chocolate, or please we'll go for an, the last chocolate. What applications and ideas has this session treated for you, or what will you take out of this session and do in your job or your life? I think I, I just recognise the difference in urban recovery to the to an country city. Mm -hmm. I think you can try with us in Tasmania and what where it's more very urban based compared to in a country farming setting like chalk and cheese in terms of response. Absolutely, there were things that we got from Eden Valley and interstate. Uh, called up WA Fire Recovery to find out what they were doing because what we had in Samson Flat was very, very different um, and not quite applicable in every stage. What else are you going to take away from today? Gardening. Gardening. Yeah, the importance <laughs> of gardening. We you know gardening in after a fire in Victoria and yeah, same thing. A, product, a place for someone to go to that's still green. Yeah. And then I'll tell you two things here. There was, um, uh, they won't mind me mentioning that the bars lost their house and their daughters lost their house as well. Um, and they don't know what they're doing yet. They might have decided they were in the caravan where their house used to be, just so they're in the same location. And they're waking up every day to all of that mess. Their son came out and put some artificial turf down so his mum could wake up every morning looking at green. And their farmers, he is a top international CSIRO scientist. So to do that made a massive mental health benefit to her. All right, one last comment, anyone? The importance of asking. The importance of asking, goodness. And they felt so empowered by being asked. All right. I don't need more chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of sugar, I give you sugar. All right, do you have any questions of me or anything else? Because I know that with Christchurch there seems to be 
uh, is far more complex than this. Um, any other questions or comments in closing? Was there any sort of engagement strategies that didn't work? Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we tailored it for the purpose. So sometimes I'd walk in and I went, oh, this isn't walking. Sometimes I literally walked out of an eight bureau meeting and I walked back in. Because um, I went, no, I've walked in the wrong way. I've, I've held myself wrong, whatever else. And largely I was the only female in a room of 60 blokes. But largely they wanted me there. Because I said, I'll come for the first 10 minutes. And I went, no, 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 stay. We value you here. We want you here. So I had to make sure that that self-talk and that power posing and everything else, look up and ready, and ready, and oh, cutting, I think. She talks in a book called Presence, she, and cutting. She talks about um, in being in the right headspace and everything else. So there's some things that didn't work, and a lot of that was just us being prepared. So you might notice I was in here an hour before the presentation, being prepared and everything else. So it's a lot about um, us knowing the audience and us just listening and feeling the vibe of the room as well. Andrew? Is there anything that the NRM have put into place since the fires or are planning to do um, in case it happens again? Um, like less, our, lessons yep. learned. Absolutely, we're writing all of that up again and we're doing that as part of the statewide approach of writing up um, because there's going to be a handbook. One part of it is the lessons learned, one part of it is um, mitigation, how can I prepare? And one part of it is going to be when, not if. Um, so a lot of that will be coming out of it. Um, it has recognised the importance of our grower groups, our farming groups, our community groups. So we've got a massive internal push to connect with them even more. Um, and that's particularly, we found that in flood recovery. We called them up as soon as that happened. We were there and they're like, we can't ask anything more of you. That was going to be my second question. With the floods in Virginia recently, yep. has any lesson learned been dragged over? I know it's a different kind of kind of natural disaster, but is there anything that you've used similar? It was really interesting. Alex Zimmerman is taking charge of it again, and it is different and it's a little bit more complex, so I might be asking you about some questions. Um, it, there's different organisations involved and PERS has taken a more of a lead, so we may not ever become the relevant authority for it, um, but we literally lifted up the recovery centre in Goula and placed it down in Virginia. And so we knew everyone's roles, we knew what we were doing, um, and so a lot of our lessons learned, we've applied in what we do, how we do it, but there are some processes that we'll definitely be changing and altering because they don't speak a lot of English, it's a different industry, their business aren't, businesses aren't necessarily set up as robustly, um, and there's different types of damages that takes a different timeline. So definitely lessons learned, but we'll go see how we go in the next couple of months. Fantastic. So please join me and thank Taryn for her fantastic <laughs>